turn to two openings, please, this evening. Proverbs 10, Ecclesiastes 11. Proverbs 10, Ecclesiastes 11. Let's believe together for utterance. You shouldn't just look to me. I shouldn't just look to you. We should all look to him and believe that we hear from him and receive from him. In fact, let's just release our faith in prayer right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask and agree together for utterance, exact, and ears to hear, and eyes that receive, eyes that see, and a heart that receives, and we'll give you the glory. We purpose ahead of time not to be forgetful hearers, but to be doers, and we know as we do, we will be blessed. Said out loud, I'm a receiver. I have eyes that see. I have ears that hear. I'm a receiver. And I'm a doer. I'm a doer. I'm a doer of the Word of God. You know, that's the only people that get results. Not just the uh, Bible thumpers or note takers or CD or DVD players or meeting goers. You can go to meetings all your life and just not experience what you should. But if you begin to do it, begin to act on it, begin to put it into practice, then you begin to see changes. We began some weeks back on a series we called How We're Calling, How to Harvest. How to Harvest. We've already covered quite a bit of ground and so if you haven't been with us, let me encourage you to go online and download the previous messages, video or audio, whatever works for you. Get caught up. Or if you're in the building, we have hard copy. We have CDs, DVDs. It won't cost you anything. And remember, uh, no charge means no excuse for not knowing it, not getting it. And uh, we, our main scriptures were in Genesis where it says as long as the earth exists, uh, planting and harvesting, cold heat, summer and winter will never stop. The easy to read of Genesis 8.22 said there will always be a time for planting and a time for harvest. The BBE says there are, uh, while the earth goes on, seed time and getting in of the grain, uh, among other things, will not come to an end. So, uh, Jesus referred to the principle of sowing and reaping as he said, if you don't understand this, how will you understand all the parables? We might say it's, it's the granddaddy principle uh, through all the earth. I, I, did anybody eat anything today? How many ate something today? Do you know why you ate? Seed time and harvest. Right? Everything in this uh, world operates by it. And spirit, spiritually, the principle is the same. The reason it exists is because it existed in the spirit. Uh, and it, it came from there. And so, we've been talking about how to harvest. A lot of people believe in sowing, believe in giving. You know, we just had the offering. And, and, and myself, a lot of you just, just gave in that. And we don't believe we just gave it away. We don't just believe it's gone. We believe we sowed it. Yes. We planted it. We invested something. Thank you, Lord. And uh, I've heard people say, mock folks like me and, and say, oh, there's, that's just ridiculous. There's nothing in the Bible about sowing and reaping of finances and that kind of thing. That's just some scheme to, to, to make the offerings bigger. And, and, and you wonder what Bible they read. Because, man, it's from lid to lid. Right? It's, sowing and reaping is all over the place. And some chapters, it's sowing and reaping about, and it's talking about finances and offerings. Obviously, the whole chapters are about it. And so, uh, uh, you know, I guess you can see and not see. And uh, anyway, uh, talking about that, if you have never heard about sowing and reaping, well, you need to... Uh, take advantage of the materials that are available and, and get your nose in the Bible and see what it says. But we're talking primarily to folks that already believe 
in sowing and reaping and maybe have done it for some time. And we're dealing with what I believe is a misconception amongst so-called faith people, word people, and that is that if we just give enough and give in enough offerings and give enough and make enough confessions, then we will experience the full harvest and, and all the blessings automatically. And that just is not true. Sowing and giving is part of it. Making confessions is definitely part of it. But it's not all of it. It's not all there is to it. Uh, you got those scriptures that are mentioned to you? What was it? Proverbs what? In Proverbs, the uh, 10th chapter and the 4th verse, it says, He becomes poor that deals with a slack hand. Uh, the, the new century says a lazy person will end up poor. But a hard worker will become rich. The hand of the diligent makes rich. Did you know rich is a Bible word? It's not an ugly word. It's not a bad word. <laughs> Actually, poor is a bad word. It's a four-letter word. <laughs> So is sick. Yeah, that's Another right. four-letter word. Yeah. <laughs> so is lost. But aren't you glad that we've been redeemed? Yes, sir. Scripture says we've been redeemed. Christ has redeemed us yeah. from all of those. Now, uh, he goes on to say in verse 5, He that gathers in summer is a wise son. But he that sleeps in harvest is a son that causes shame. Now, we're talking about how to harvest. And, and obviously, we're talking about how to harvest off of money and things that you've sown in the past. But not just that. It's not limited to that. This is, we're talking about, talking about everything that sowing and reaping deals with, which is every area of life. You know, uh, if you're experiencing lack... In any area, you want to check up on your sewing. If you don't have enough friends, <laughs> how good of a friend are you? Are you sewing friendship? If, uh, if people are not kind to you, are you kind? If people judge you, do you judge and criticize and find fault? If people are not loyal to you, have you sown loyalty and faithfulness? Do you understand what I'm talking about? See, this principle of sowing and reaping works in every area. And the first place to check up is, you know, well, I need more friends. No, you need to be a friend. <laughs> I know when we first started in this ministry, uh, Phyllis and I, we had our little office in our house. And our first mail out... Uh, Four or five of our friends helped us. And uh, we, uh, uh, the Lord had dealt with me and, and my, my first letter that I wrote to our partners, which weren't that many. Uh, I, I sat down, I said, Lord, I don't want to ask for money. And I don't think I need to. What do I need to do? How do I need to do this? And we started almost immediately sending a message Amen. and at no charge. And back then it was tapes, you know, not CDs. But um, I said, I, I want to sow something. I don't want to ask. I want to give. And I believe if I give, I'll receive Hallelujah. without asking. And um, uh, the Lord dealt with me. I don't mean I heard a voice, but inside me, I remember it distinctly in a time of prayer. He said, you need, uh, you need partners to do what I'm calling you to do, obviously. And the first thing is, you need to be a good partner. And then you need to claim partners for me to deal with people. 
And so uh, I talked to Phyllis and we reviewed our partnership and we increased our partnership with people that we were ministries that we were already sowing to and we, and we made some adjustments and where we hadn't been consistent, we became consistent and, and made sure it was there every month. And, and where we felt like we hadn't been doing enough, we increased it. And I know it didn't sound like a whole lot uh, now, but you know, it was $20 a month and, and it was $25 a month. And then we, we increased it to $50 a month. And eventually we increased some of them to $100 a month. And we just kept going. Because the Lord dealt with me, the first thing you need to do is be good partners. And then you need to claim. And so we, we did that. And the Lord dealt with me to do that first. And then ask me for partners. Everybody with me now? Do that first. Be so partnership. Be a partner. And it applies to every other. Be loyal. Be faithful. Be a friend. And then ask the Lord. For friends. For loyalty, for faithfulness, for whatever it is you need. And so we asked the Lord and, and, and he said, I said, well, how many should I ask for? And he spoke to my heart. He said, it's not up to what I can do. What can you believe? <laughs> you know, we don't receive according to what he can do. He can do everything. We receive according to our faith. So we claimed 25 partners. <laughs> you might say, why didn't you claim a million? Because that wouldn't have been real to me. That's just a word. Are you with me, friends? This is, faith is not pretending. Faith is not imaginary. What, I, I thought about it. What can we, Phyllis and I talked about it, what can we confidently really believe? And so we, we claimed 25, and it wasn't long till we had like 18, 19, 20 partners. And so the Lord dealt with me, don't wait till they all get in to claim the next round. You stay ahead. And you, so we claimed 50 and, and then we claimed, I forget what it was, uh, 500 and then, you know, on and on. Keep, you know, wh wherever your faith is, according to your faith. So be it unto you. So uh, in, in sowing, you sow in the area that you want to reap and everything produces after its own kind. But even though you've sown and it's been reproduced, that doesn't mean that everything now is up to the Lord. We also have responsibility in the reaping just like we do in the sowing. And that's the area that a lot of word people, faith people have missed it in. I know the Lord had to correct me some years ago about it because I was thinking, well, if I give and I make a good confession, I'm done. Then it's up to the Lord to get it back to me. Well, yes and no. Sowing and reaping spiritually is just like sowing and reaping naturally. He uses sowing and reaping crops to help us to understand spiritual sowing and reaping. And when the farmer plants his crop and he gets the seed in the ground, well then at that point it is up to God to make the seed do what only it can do and the ground do what it can do and to send them the rain and the sunshine. But, he, but when the crop comes in, it's not up to God right. to get the crop in. Right. Every farmer knows this. The corn does not just march out of the field into the silo by itself. That's right. Everybody knows this. And yet why do Christians think that reaping is all up to God and is automatic? It's been wrong thinking. It's been ignorance. It's been misunderstanding, misconception. And that's what we're talking about. According to this verse, could you sleep through a harvest? He said, uh, he that sleeps in a harvest is a son that causes shame. Uh, there are people that have lost crops. Just out of pure idleness and laziness in the natural. They just goofed off and slept. It was time to get out there and get on the tractor. It was time to get out there and get in the field. The crop's ready. When the crop's ready, it's time to get it in. You don't mess around. You can't wait. When it's ready, get it in. That's right. 
And we know people have slept through and, and been lazy and lost crops naturally. Could it happen spiritually? Well, it's exactly the same principle. Go to Ecclesiastes, the 11th chapter. I might, somebody might say, well, Brother Keith, you, you've already been over this. Two, three, four, five times. Yeah, I remembered that I had been over it before. <laughs> I didn't forget that. <laughs> Couple of reasons. I'll give you three good reasons why I'm going over it again. Number one, I believe the Lord's leading me to. And that's good enough. If you, did, if you only had reason number one. Reason number two, there's other people here besides you. <laughs> There's people that are hearing this for the very first time. In here, watching by internet, people that will download this maybe even next year. Right? Or watch it next week. And uh, they have, this is the first time they have ever heard any of this at all. Some of them got saved two weeks ago. Hmm? And then thirdly, just because you heard it one time or two. <laughs> <laughs> does not mean you got it. And it ain't about what you remember or what you wrote down or what you logged in your mental library. Do you know how you, really be, how you could know that you're really beginning to get it? You get excited about it. When it, when it really gets in your spirit and it gets real to you and you begin acting on it and seeing results, you will get excited. Yeah. Every time right. you will get excited. Right. And as long as you're hearing it going, yeah, we've already heard that, let's move on. You ain't got it. That's right. And which is why we're going to read it again. <laughs> we're going to read it again. Ecclesiastes 11. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 11, 4. Says he that observes the wind, what will happen? He won't sow. He that regards the clouds, what will happen? Are there people who don't give, they don't give offerings in church, they don't give things to their neighbor or to their family or to the people they work with because they get to looking at the wrong thing. And they get to thinking, well, I got this bill coming up and, and I got that and, and, um, and I like that. I just want to keep that. <laughs> Or whatever, th you get to looking at the wrong thing and you will procrastinate or you will put it off. And that's good enough for the devil. If he can get you to put it off, that is one of his greatest tools is procrastination. Because then tomorrow, what do you think he's going to try to get you to do? Just, just, just put it off. And, and you never do anything tomorrow. Because tomorrow is not here. When it gets here, what will it be? Today, and unless you do it today, you will never do it. That's right. That's right. Do you know what I'm talking about? That procrastination is one of the greatest deceptions that the enemy has. And so if you get to looking at the wrong thing, you just won't sow. But is it true, even after you have sown, you can get to looking at the wrong thing and not reap? Yes. Apparently. What did the rest of the scripture say? He that regards the clouds shall not reap. God's word translation says, whoever watches the wind will never plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will never harvest. Well, we don't want to never harvest. We want to harvest. So we need to not look at the wrong thing. You could get to looking at the wrong thing and not harvest. You can be idle and not take any responsibility and think it's not up to you, think it's all up to God, and not harvest. You can get to looking at the wrong thing and not harvest. Do we have something to do with harvest? Yes, sir. We do. We do. You know, you can get to looking at the economy and going, well, yeah, but man, you got this going on and you got that going on. And I just don't see how that could happen before the end of the year with this economy, with the money we've been making so far with the way the business has been, with the way the company, you're looking at the clouds. Yes. And you won't reap. 
Because you've already accepted excuses why you can't have it now or in your town or with who you are. Well, we just, you know, I haven't had much education and we just don't know anybody and, and I don't know how. You're looking at the clouds. Amen. You're accepting and making excuses why it can't happen for you. I want you to know Come on. that God could pay every one of your bills and get you completely out of debt by the end of next week and not make one phone call and not have to change anything in the government. That's right. All your company, all your friends, all your family, he could do it. Do you believe it or not? But it'll never happen with you looking at the clouds. You've got to look away from everything that tells you it can't happen for you or it can't happen where you live or it can't happen with what you make or it can't happen with who you are and where you're from. You've got to get sassy. Come on, you've you got to, something's got to come up inside you and you say, what has that got to do with anything? Me being this or me being that or me not being this or not knowing that or not coming from here or coming from there. It's not me a doing it. <laughs> it's not based on me. All I got to do is believe God and not look at the clouds. Say it out loud. I'm not looking at the clouds. I shall reap. Yes, I shall reap. We shall reap. Go with me, if you would, to uh, Mark 4 and then Exodus 16. You, you did say you're believing with me, right? Mark 4. Then we're going over to Exodus 16. Now, everything, I tell you, uh, you don't have to turn there, but uh, put this up on the screen for us. Acts uh, 20, 32. You're going to Mark 4. He said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Whether you're talking about being able to reap or whether you're talking about being able to lose weight or whether you're talking about getting out of debt or whether you're talking about getting free from some kind of habit or addiction or whether you're talking about uh, getting free and quitting some kind of sin that you just keep falling into. No matter what it is, the first step is you getting built up yes. on the inside. Yes. And that's the step that people skip and they keep looking for the right formula or somebody that's got the right prayer or the right touch. No, friend, the first step, everything that needs to be done for our provision, for our deliverance, for our salvation, for our healing, for our victory has already been done. Jesus did it. He bought it. He's got it. It's finished. Paid for. Done. Done. In fact, it's already been bought, done, and given to us. But that's not the end. What's been given to us must be received, must be possessed. And that takes faith. And that takes strength of spirit. The reason why you, me, any of us keep yielding to something, keep falling in the same area, know that you want to do this or that, but you were intending on doing it five years ago, ten years ago, you hadn't done it yet, is weakness. It's weakness on the inside. 
flesh is dominating. Unrenewed mind is dominating because the spirit is weak. So, so many people, their spirit is so, so very weak and their flesh just dominates them. I mean, you, you, we all got uh, desires. Uh, you, your flesh hadn't been born again. It's the same flesh that you had before you got born again. It's the same one you used to sin with. Whatever weird or bizarre stuff you ever did, it's the same one. And it will still do the same stuff if you let it. First Corinthians 9, why don't you turn over there and look at that. First Corinthians 9, I believe it's what, 27? First Corinthians 9, 27, he said, but I keep under my body. He's not referring to his body as him. He must be something else. He's referring to him as his spirit. I keep under my body. If you read some modern translations, one says, I beat it black and blue. Because they're, they're endeavoring to describe the Greek word here is very harsh. You know, you need to be harsh with yourself, not with others. I mean, you need to talk straight to yourself. Uh, most folk got it the other way around. They baby themselves and are hard on other people. Now let's get that turned back around. Now you need to grab yourself by the ear and say, boy, I am talking to you. <laughs> you are going to do this. And you are not going to do this. And you need to put your foot down hard. You need to be rough with yourself. Discipline yourself. I keep under my body. I bring it into subjection. <clears throat> Lest by any means when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He didn't say I did it one time and I got it. What did he say? I, I, I keep it. I do this. This is a continuous thing. Paul said this. He said, even after I've had multiple visitations of the Lord, I've, I've been caught up to the third heaven. I, I've got all this revelation. I've been all over the world preaching the gospel. I could still wind up disqualified. Yep. That word castaway means. I could wind up disqualified from the ministry. I could wind up disqualified from what God called me to do. Why? Because your flesh will do anything you let it do. Yeah, your flesh. So, what's the solution? Well, if your, if your spirit's weak and your flesh wants to do something, it wants what it wants. And it says, I want it. And down inside your spirit goes, no. <laughs> it's wrong. You know, it's not right. Go do your flesh. Says, Shut up. I want it. And I'm going to have it. No. <laughs> People's spirits are so weak. So they're dominated by their flesh. That's why they'll do stuff and they'll do it. And after they do it, they feel so bad. They feel condemned. But then they'll do it again. And again. It's possible to get so built up in your spirit. That you are so strong inside. That you actually intimidate your own flesh. You can turn it around until instead of your flesh being so belligerent, after, I didn't say this would happen overnight, but after a while, your flesh will begin to go, uh, I was thinking about, no. <laughs> okay, thought I'd ask. <laughs> what if we, No. Okay. <laughs> what will do that for you? Put that scripture back up from Acts. What will do that for you? No, Acts, the previous one. What was it? Uh, hmm? Yeah, thank you. The word of his grace is able. The word itself 
is able, has the ability in it to do what? Build you up so that you are able to lay hold of your inheritance. What has already been given to you. Oh, friend, if you really believe this, it would stir you up more than ever before to read your chapter every day and be in church when you're supposed to be in church and when you're here, you are here and you are drinking it in and you are feeding on it and if there's an area that you've been weak in, get extra resources and feed that into you. Why? Because that's what you got to have first. And if you get strong enough on the inside, you'll find yourself rising up at where you used to just yield and wouldn't even think about it. You'll say, no, I'm not going to do that. And you'll be strong enough to resist it. And it was the Word that gave that to you. The Word that built you up and made you strong like that. And what's happening right now is God is ministering the Word to us that is building us up so we can reap. <laughs> so we can harvest. Somebody say, I receive it. It's making me strong right now. See, the same thing is true if you, if you think about, well, man, I've sown all this. And man, what a harvest that would be on that. And it's easier just to go, eh, Whatever. Whatever the Lord wants. That's <laughs> sleeping through your harvest. It's easier to make excuses and look around and go, well, you know, this is not a good time. And maybe someday, and then three years later you go, maybe someday. And then ten years later, maybe someday. Weakness. No. The Lord's putting into us. So he's going to show us things Amen. to go after. Yeah. To pursue. Yeah. And we won't, we won't see how. And we won't know the way. But you don't have to. Right. You'll take a step. And he'll show you the next. And you'll pursue it. And you'll go after it. And you'll get it. Amen. And you'll reap it. Yeah. It takes faith. Yeah. It takes vision. Yeah. And tell me how you get your faith. It comes from this word, from the anointed word. Hallelujah. I took time to say all that, I believe, by the leading of the Lord, but also so that you will be actively believing that's what's happening to me right now, tonight. Every service, every time I'm in the Word or hearing the Word, my spirit is getting stronger. I'm getting built up in me. Hallelujah. You can get so strong to what you for formerly were just terrified of. You can get so strong in your spirit, though you were scared of dying, scared of cancer. You can feel like you're 20 feet tall on the inside. You'll look cancer in the eye and curse it and tell it, it can't stay in your body. Come on, are you listening to me? Only one thing can make you like that. This word. The anointed living word of God. Somebody say, thank you for the word. Thank you, Lord, for the anointed word. The anointed word. You in Mark 4? 26. Mark 4. 26. Jesus said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. He said, the kingdom of God works like this. Just like when a man takes a seed... And he sows it in the ground. You believe Jesus knew what he's talking about? Yes. Verse 27. He should sleep and rise night and day and the, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knows not how. And here's the good thing. You don't have to know how. It works. It'll still work. In fact, it's working while you're sleeping. <laughs> It'd be good to remind yourself of that. You lay down on the bed and you go... Every good seed I've sown is going to be working all night while I'm sleeping. It's working all day even when I don't think about it. It's working. What's it doing? 
It's working so that to the end that it springs and grows up. Verse 28. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself. We don't have to do this. This God does this. Through his creation. Through the principles he's created. And the seed and the ground. Earth brings forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear. After that the full corn in the ear. Doesn't happen overnight. Doesn't happen all at once. It happens progressively. So you don't sow a seed on most things and go reap it the next day. Do you? We know this in the natural. He said the kingdom of God works like this too. Verse 29. But... When the fruit is brought forth, when you've got the full corn in the ear, it's ready to harvest, immediately he puts in the sickle. I want you to say it out loud. He puts in the sickle. He puts in the sickle. Who is he referring to? He. The Lord? No. The Lord puts in the sickle. No. no. He's referring to the same person that planted the seed. You back up and read the beginning of the passage. The same person that planted the seed, he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. Who's responsible for sowing the seed? We are. The man is. We are. Who's responsible for making it grow? God is. Who's responsible for putting in the sickle and reaping it when it's ready? We are. We are. We are. And this is the area we've been weak in. Now, uh, what do we say, Exodus? Go there, please. Exodus 16, verse 4. Exodus 16 and 4. The Lord said to Moses, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people will go out and gather. Everybody say, gather. Who's going to rain down the bread from heaven? God. God's going to do it. Who's going to gather it in? The people are going to do it. The people will go out and gather at a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. And, and this is all about gathering and gathering like he told you to. Is the Lord serious about you gathering like he tells you to? Have you ever read this chapter? It's all about the gathering. And he was very serious about it. Verse 5. It'll come to pass on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in. And it shall, it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Everybody say gather. 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 Should we have gathering faith? Skip on down to verse 16. It do you good to just sometime at your convenience read this whole chapter carefully, everything around it. He said, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. What's the first word? Gather. gather. Everybody say gather. gather. Why don't you say it two or three times? Gather. 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 <laughs> Tell your neighbor, gather. 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 You know what gather means? Gather means pick, pick it up, hmm? collect it together, gather, gather. Gather it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take every man uh, for them which are in his tents. Let's read a couple of verses here. Verse 17. The children of Israel did so, and they did what? They gathered. Some more, some less. What about 30, 60, 100 fold? People say, well, I don't believe in that. And one of the reasons why good people that love the Lord, they're sincere, and they say they don't believe in 100 fold, is because what we're just talking about, they believe the gathering is up to God. And so they've taken no responsibility for the gathering. They haven't experienced anything like a hundredfold. And so because they haven't experienced it, they've concluded it's not real. But some gather more than others. 
Some gathered more. Some gathered less. I don't know if you heard that or not. Some gather more than others. Some gather just enough. Some gather more than enough. Some gather more than enough for themselves and even enough for other people round about them. <laughs> you got folks that don't gather at all. And you got folks that gather just barely enough. And then you got the extra gatherers. The abundance. The surplus gatherer. Yeah, that's right. Anybody sign up for that team? Huh? The extra gatherer. The gathered that gather more. In verse 18. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over. He that gathered little had no lack. Do you, do you believe that no matter how much you gather, the Lord will show you what to do with it? There'll be a place for it. He that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. 19. And Moses said, let no man leave of it till the morning. 20. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not, but some of them left it and it bred worms and stank and Moses was wroth with them. 21. How many know what you do gather, you should do what he tells you to do with it. And if he says, don't hold on to this, If you do hold on to it, it's going to get stinky around your house. Yeah. <laughs> and you're going to wish you had turned it loose because it's not going to be a blessing. Amen. You hold on to something that the Lord tells you to turn loose. And it's going to be a burden to you. They gathered. Somebody say gather, gather. Do you see how much gathering is talked about in it? Gather, gather. They gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. Verse 22. It came to pass on the sixth day, they did what? They gathered twice as much. Some gathered little, some gathered much. Sometimes they gathered the same. Sometimes they gathered twice as much. But even when God causes it to fall out of the sky, you still got to go. Pick it up. Right? How do you harvest? For one thing, you get up and leave the house. You don't just sit on the sofa and make confessions only. The Lord will say, go over here and gather. Go over there and gather. Okay, now don't hold on to this. Let it go. All right, go over here now and you'll gather twice as much as you've been gathering. Are you willing to be led of the Lord? Yes. Led by the Spirit? Yes. See, our tithing and our sowing qualifies us for this. For the Lord to get involved in our business, in our affairs, and to multiply it, and to influence people in situations, and, and jobs, and contracts, and sales, and, and whatever. But then, when he deals with you to get up and go over there, you'll never experience that harvest unless you go gather it in. Go over there and see them. Go over there and do this. And you must not go trying to manipulate or get anything from anybody. You're not looking at them. You just do what the Lord told you to do. You just show up where he tells you to show when and do. And sometimes it'll, it'll seem like you're just working for nothing. And you're just sowing and giving and asking for nothing. But old friend, when you obey him, you'll be at the right place at the right time. And you'll reap. Uh, Phyllis and I have seen this over and over and over again. I know when we, when we left Tulsa and we came here, the Lord dealt with me that we would reap. And I didn't know what he was talking about and I, and I didn't know how, but in the next few years after that, the ministry came up to another place and we've reaped 
the word, the word supply, the TV, the internet, so many things. And I know there was a situation that had come up a while back and and I didn't see the connection until afterwards, but the Lord dealt with me at our own expense. You go over here and you do this and you do what I tell you to do. Well, I wasn't going with any idea of getting anything before the week was over. We had everything come in through that channel of being at that place at that time. Do you know what I'm talking about? It, God choreographs this, but if you stay at the house and if you don't do anything and, and if all you're willing to do is make a confession, then it can be falling out of the sky. Right. But you won't enjoy it because right. you won't leave the tent. Right. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. You'll enjoy the best. You'll enjoy the top. You know, the same thing happened with the quail in Numbers 11. He brought quail in supernaturally, but they still had to go out and gather it. You see the same kind of words, gather. Does God expect us to gather it up? What he gives, we must gather. Look in the, in the Psalms. Psalm 104 and 24. Psalm 104, 24 says, Oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your riches. Verse uh, 27. He said, these wait all upon you and that that you may give them their meat in due season. Talking about all creation and all animals and everything and everybody really. Verse 28. That you give them, they gather. Say it out loud. He gives. He gives. We, gather. we gather. Say it again. He gives. He gives. We, gather. we gather. This time say I. He gives. He gives. I, gather. I gather. He gives. He gives. I gather. The, the NIV, Psalm 104.28, NIV says, when you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open their hand, your hand, they are satisfied with good things. Don't let this be too simple for you tonight now. There's a lot of folks have been missing out because even though he gave, they didn't gather it. And then they made up all kind of things and said, so, well, he, did, he must not want us to have it. Well, it never happened. We just don't know why. No, you've got to gather up what he gives. John 3, 27, don't turn there, but just put it on the screen for us. John 3, 27, Jesus said this, a man can receive nothing. Now, you remember Mark eleven twenty four. What things serve you desire when you pray? Believe that you receive them. That word, if you look it up, it literally means take. T a k e. Believe that you take them, and you shall have them. Same same kind of idea here. A man can receive nothing. A man can take nothing. You could also say he can gather nothing, except it be given him from heaven. It, you couldn't take it unless it had been given. But even after it's given, you're not going to enjoy it unless you take it. Go to Deuteronomy, please. First chapter. How can you tell if something's really getting in you and you're really making progress? So you can tell we've got a little ways to go. But we're not going to give up. <laughs> Deuteronomy 1. What I'm saying is don't, don't say, well, I already know this. I've heard this. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. That's not the point. Do you want to reap? Yes. Something's got to change then for us to come up to another place, come into another level. And his word is building us up. Yeah. Making us able yeah. to do that. 
Deuteronomy 1 and 8. I'm going to be repetitive and redundant on purpose, just warning you ahead of time. He said, God said, Behold, I have set the land before you. Sit back. <laughs> huh? And wait on me. Mm -mm. I have set the land before you. Do what? Go in and possess it. Go get it. Go, I'm giving it to you. What does that mean? When God says, when God gives you something, what does that mean? It means he has obtained it, he bought it, he created it, he paid for it, and now he has made it available, he has made it accessible. Hmm? That doesn't mean he puts it down your mouth. That doesn't mean he puts it in your hand while you sit and do nothing. And that was what the first generation of Israelites that were delivered out of Egyptian bondage stumbled over. Didn't they? He said, I found something for you, boys and girls. I have found the most awesome place. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. You don't have to irrigate it like y'all did down in, in Egypt. I rain on it. Yes, hallelujah. It, it produces. You, you should see the produce. And didn't they when they went and found, I mean, one, one cluster of grapes, two men had to haul it. Amen. You talk about produce. This is pre-miracle grow. <laughs> I guess not. It was miracle growth. It was just the real miracle growth. <laughs> he said, it's got all kind of precious metals. You can dig in the hills. You can get iron, brass, gold, silver. It's got everything. And they're all sitting there going, oh. And you gave it to us. I'm giving it to you. They got pumped. They got excited. Yeah. Yeah. And they went down there and there's all these giants living on it. He didn't tell them about the giants. And these giants think it's theirs. <laughs> oh, but friend, if God has given it to you, if God has given it to you, I don't care how many titles they got. I don't care how many lawyers they got. I don't care how many governments or armies. Come on, are you listening? If God has given it to you, you can have it. He expects you to live in it, to enjoy it. But it's not just going to fall on you automatically because he gave it to you and that's the thing people have tripped over. Well, God told me he gave it to me. Why don't I see it? He told me he gave it to me. Why am I not enjoying it? Because what God gives by grace, we must gather by faith. That's right. What he provides by his power and ability, we must possess yes. by our faith. Right. Amen. And if you don't possess what he's provided, even though it was always yours, you can live and die and never enjoy it. And that's sad. Yes. Isn't that sad? Yes. That first generation of Israelites. They, they wandered around out there in the wilderness for decades, decades, grew old and died and never experienced it. And the Bible said it was theirs. God had given it to them from the foundation of the world he planned for them to have it. That's sad. That's not who I want to be. 
and what my life is to be in my mind. I, I made up my mind. I'm a possessor. Yeah. I'm a gatherer. Hmm? I'm a receiver. How about you? I'm a, I'm a harvester. Hmm? And it doesn't make any difference how big and ugly and hairy the devil is that's sitting on top of it. He just will have to leave. <laughs> and how long he's had it, he's going to have to turn it loose. It doesn't matter what. It's going to take what has to take place to happen so that it's unencumbered and so that I'm enabled and so it all works out. That's not my job. It's my job to not quit. It's my job to believe and persevere and lay hold and receive. And having done all to stand, don't quit. Keep standing. Keep going. Take steps. Somebody say, lay hold, lay hold, lay hold, hold. possess. Are we talking about reaping? Are we talking about harvesting? Second chapter, Deuteronomy 2.31. The Lord said to me, what did he say? Behold, I have begun to give Sihon and his land before you. End of sentence? End of scripture? Now what? What's the understood subject here? You now begin to possess it that you may inherit his land. I'm giving it to you, so get it. Now see, religion hadn't taught us that. Religion has taught us, well now, don't be presumptuous. It's all up to the Lord. And basically, do nothing. And wait. And wonder. No. The Lord, when he provided the new birth for us, and we've been born again, and born sons and daughters of God, sons of God are not wimps. Sons of God are not nothings. He wanted us to have and experience the glory of walking by faith and to be a part of it. If you never lift a finger, you never have anything to do with it, you get no reward, you get no satisfaction, no accomplishment. So he left some curse, he left some demons. He left some stuff for you to overcome. So that when you do, as you most certainly will, if you go with him, it's sweet. And you get reward. He can, then he can justly reward you because you actually did something. Instead of just lay out and go, drop it on me. Just, just drop it on me. I really don't even want to get up. If you could just bring it to me and just truck. I'm sorry, that is not how it works. <laughs> Deuteronomy 11, going over there. 11.10. He said, the land, whether you go in to possess it, it's not like the land of Egypt. When you came out where you sow your seed and water it with your foot as the garden of herbs. Let's read a couple of verses here. Verse 11. The land where you go in to possess it, it's a land of hills and valleys, drinks water of the rain of heaven. A land which the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. Always watching. It'll come to pass if you'll hearken diligently to my commandments, which I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. I'll give you the rain, first rain, the latter rain, that you may do what? That you may gather in your corn and your wine and your oil, verse 15, and I'll send grass in your fields for your cattle and you may eat and be full. Everybody say, eat and be full. full. Now drop down to verse 24. Verse 24. Here's how it's going to happen. Every 
every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. Now he's not just talking about that they stepped on it and stepped right back. He's talking about possessing. You go down there and take it. From the wilderness to the river to the uttermost sea, your coast will be. Verse 25, when the, now this is what it means when the Lord has given you something. There shall no man be able to stand before you. Why? Because the Lord's given it to you. Who's bigger than him? Who can stop him and stand in his way? The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon as he has said unto you. Now notice, when you start treading on it, when you start possessing it, when you start gathering it, then he's able to go on into it ahead of you and cause the fear to fall. Did you remember that the, the sea, Red Sea, did not split until they stepped off into it? And the flooded Jordan did not split until they stepped off into it? They, they were crying and, oh God, oh God. Well, he said, quit crying to me and go forward. And when they stepped off into the water, that's when miracles started happening. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Verse 31. You shall pass over Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you shall possess it and dwell therein. You'll possess it and dwell in it. Now, I won't take the time to read. There, there are numerous, numerous verses well, I do, I do want to read one more. 26.1. If you want to study this on your own, man, it's just verse after verse after verse. It says the same thing. 26 verse 1. It shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance and possess it and dwell in it. Say it out loud. The Lord gives it. The Lord gives it. You possess it. You, possess it. you dwell in it. Joshua 21, Joshua 21, 43, they got it on the screen, the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he swore to give to their fathers, and then what happened? They possessed it, and then what happened? They dwelt in it. There's something in between God giving it. And you living in it. And this is what folks have missed. Well, if God gave it to me, why am I still like this? People think if God gives it to you, then you live in it. Mm -mm. There's something in between. Read the verse again. Read the verse. The Lord did what? Gave. He gave. Then what happened? They possessed, they possessed it. Then what happened? Dwell. Dwell means live. They lived in it. There's something in between God giving it and you living in it. What is it? Us possessing it. Us possessing it. That takes faith. He gave us salvation. Are there people in the world that are not saved? Can they say it's because it's not God's will for them to be saved? That wouldn't be true. Could they say they're waiting on God to save them whenever he gets ready to? That wouldn't be true. Why are they not experiencing salvation? They've not received it. They don't possess it. God's given us healing. Does that mean you'll, you'll live in healing? No. You've got to possess it. Hmm? God's given us peace. He's given us provision. 
He said, so you see, now multiply it. Does that mean we'll automatically experience it and live in 30, 60, 100 fold? No, you got to gather it. Right. You got to possess it. There's something in between God giving and you living in. What is it? Say me, me, me possessing it. What's in between God giving it to you and you living in it? Me possessing it. And how are you going to do that? You're going to do that by faith and you're going to do that by the leading of the Spirit. Glory to God. Glory to God. When we came here, this was our, a part of our promised land. Hmm? Yes. There were obstacles. We didn't regale you with all the stories. <laughs> but there were obstacles. But we've reaped. Yes. The Lord's dealing with me that we're about to reap in Sarasota. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hmm? Oh, yes. This church yes. has sown and sown and sown. And it's time to reap. Yes. And we're going to reap down there. It's like the Lord said, throw your net on the right side of the ship. Well, he said, throw your net down in Sarasota. We shall reap. We shall reap. We're going to reap, for lack of a better phrase, hand over fist. We're going to reap. Do you believe it? But see, you will never reap if you don't step out. You, we could sit by and go, well, Lord, we've sown, we've sown big seeds, we've sown big seeds. When are we going to see our 30, 60, 100 fold? If you never step out, if you never possess, it can be scary to your flesh. You know, we're working without a net. <laughs> but we got a God, which is better than a net. <laughs> You're awake tonight. <clears throat> Go to Numbers, the 14th chapter. Let's look at the danger. What has happened? What happened to these people? What has happened so many times? Numbers 13, the Lord had told them they had arrived finally after, you know, all these challenges and they've arrived at the border of the land God gave them. And he told them, I've given it to you. Now go possess it. So they sent spies into the land, to check it out. Never been there before. Where are they going to go in? How are they going to do this? And they found, just like the Lord told them, it is amazing. The climate, the soil, layout of the land, the rivers, the water systems, the fruit, amazing. But <laughs> there's giants, huge guys, walled cities. Iron chariots, that'd be like tanks today. They got armies, and they're armed, and they're big, and they're bad, and they're mean. <laughs> and they let that eclipse the fact that God said, I've given this to you. Are they looking at clouds? And did that keep them from reaping? Mm. If God has given it to you, why look at anything else? What's bigger than Him? Hmm? If God gave it to you, I know, uh, oh, decades ago, uh, Phyllis and I were ministering in another state, other side of the country, and we'd, we'd known these people for some years, and they started their little church. In, uh, in a little bitty metal building 
that shared a metal wall with a car wash. <laughs> Tiny. And, and while I'm preaching, I hear the, the car wash start up. It's just right there. Well, these guys are believers, Amen. and they're sowers, yes. real sowers. And we came back after the service, and we had a good, good time, and I'm sitting in the chair, and, and the lady made us sandwiches, and we're talking and laughing. All at once, the Spirit of God came on me, and I said, I, I need, not a lot, most of the time, if I felt like I needed to pray, I'd have just left. But this, this was different. I knew they needed to be involved. I said, let's pray. So we all just slid off our chairs and couches and, and, and knelt down and prayed. And prayed in the Spirit and prayed for a while. They had shown me a property that was for sale. It was a, actually buildings. It was a whole shopping center. That people Nice. And people had built it out, but it didn't really go. But it wasn't but just a few years old. It, it for all purposes, new. New, very nice place. And I said, I want to go see that now. It was midnight. <laughs> they didn't blink. Yeah. He said, I got the car. <laughs> we got in the car. We all went over there. It was pitch dark and nobody around. I mean, there's a few lights, but everywhere else was dark. And, and, and we walked around and, and prayed. And I looked at him. I said, did you know? The Lord has given this to you. Hallelujah. He didn't look at me blankly. He shouted. She shouted. They shouted. I shouted. We shouted. He believed it. Now, they got a handful of people. This is a shopping center. We got on the plane and went back uh, to our home. I mean, just within a few hours, he called me. He said, did you know you guys hadn't taken off good till the guy that owned that place called me? <laughs> said, do you want this? And he said, yeah. In his mind, he's saying, the Lord already gave it to me. But he didn't tell him that. Well, It'd be neat if you say they moved in next week and that was the end of the story, but it wasn't. Weeks passed, months passed. He came up in my heart one afternoon and I just felt like I should call him. No reason other than just felt like I should. I called him. He said, oh, Brother Keith. Man, I'm so glad you called. He said, I was in the floor praying and you called. Well, I didn't know why I'd called. But I just talked and checked my heart. And he said, uh, we tried everything we know and they won't, we, we, don't have, you know, we, we, we don't have enough people, they say, to have a place like that and, and nobody will give us any financing and, and none of this. And, and I've done everything I know to do and this had been months. Does that matter? No, no sir. <laughs> That's easier to say when you're sitting in here in a cushion <laughs> chair, air conditioned, right? But it is true. I said it is true. Clouds. Everybody say clouds. Now these guys have sown. They're, they're big sowers. And God is ready to cause them to harvest a hundredfold. But it's not just going to fall on them. It's going to take faith to possess it. I said, well, that doesn't matter. And I called his name. I said, you know that doesn't matter. He said, I know it doesn't matter. I said, you know I would not just stand up and say something like that. He said, I know you. I know you wouldn't. I said, so that was either me or it was the Lord. If it was the Lord, we should rejoice. We should believe it. Yes, he said, I believe it, Brother Keith. I said, I do too. It's yours. He said, it's mine. Amen. It's mine. Amen. None of these things move me. Yes. This is my place. Yes. We prayed. We agreed. We thank God. Just a few weeks later, he called. He said, guess what? <laughs> I said, tell me. He said, my, my, my banker that we dealt with for all our life, 
wouldn't even talk to us. He said, you ain't got enough people to do anything like that. He said, the guy that owned the property, wealthiest man in the area, had the most money in the bank, <laughs> goes into the bank, tells the guy that's been shutting me down and says, I am selling this to this preacher with you or without you. He said, oh, oh, with me, with me. <laughs> and within a few days, it was theirs. It was in their name. And their little bunch was just like one little spot in the whole thing. And so they rented it out to this place and rented it out to this place and it made the payments. And they grew and they developed and they had them a fine place. When the Lord gives it to you, that's all that matters. Everything else is temporary symptoms and circumstances that are subject to change and must change. But when they went in there and they saw these giants, to them it was not a temporary thing. To them it was a hopeless thing. And they came back and they said, yeah, it's nice fruit, and yeah, it's nice land. But the people are massive, huge. They dwarf us. They, they, they look at us like grasshoppers. Well, that wasn't true. If you read the rest of the, the passages, you'll find out when they finally got in there, they found out they were afraid of them. And it's what the Lord told them. I'm going to cause the fear to fall on them. But when you believe what the devil tells you. So chapter 14, verse 1. All the congregation lifted up their voice and they cried and the people wept that night looking at clouds. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and, and murmured against Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, would God would have died in the land of Egypt. Would God would have died in the wilderness. And wherefore has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? They said, why did the Lord bring us out here? He's brought us out here to kill us. Was that true? No. Now I know you've heard some of this before, but I want you to hear it in a way you haven't heard it before. Learn how the devil operates. They're saying, they, they invented a new doctrine. They're saying God's plan was to bring us out here and kill us. Instead of acknowledging we need to man up and have some faith and take this thing. They made excuses and new doctrines as to why it was not the will of God for them to have it. It was the will of God for them to die. Has this happened again since then? With peoples and groups and whole denominations and whole veins of theological argument. People have said, well, we don't have it. it must not be the will of God. Well, we didn't get it. Must not be the will of God. Oh, it's awful this and it's awful that and we could never and there's no way and we're so weak and, and we can't do it. Must We just don't know why and, and we don't understand all these things, but it's not the will of God. Not true. Amen. Not true. Amen. Not true. God gave it to them. Yes. And he's going to be with them. He's ready. Do you believe God was ready to take them every step of the way? He's ready to move on their enemies. He's ready to empower them. He's ready to do whatever it takes. He knows exactly what it's going to take. But they wouldn't receive it. They cried. They were scared. They were mad. They resisted. Joshua and Caleb jumped up. You remember them? They said, the land, verse 7, that we passed through, it's an exceeding good land. And the Lord delights in us. He will bring us into the land. He'll give it to us. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. Don't re only rebel not against the Lord. 
Don't fear these people. They're bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us. Fear them not. Come on, let's go get it. God's with us. He's not with them. It's going to be a piece of cake. Come on. And it made these guys so mad they picked up rocks to kill them. When faith says in the presence of unbelief, we can do it. Let's get it. It makes unbelief mad. Because it's showing them up how weak and faithless they're being. You can look at clouds. You can make excuses. You can let everybody explain to you why it's not going to happen for you or for where you live or where you are. It's not going to happen now. You can cry and feel sorry for yourself. Or. <laughs> or. You can be like Joshua. You can be like Caleb. Come on and you can say. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And if he gave it to me, it's mine. I don't have to see anything or feel anything. I don't have to know how. It's mine. And you just go ahead and have a it's mine party. While the walls are still up and while the giants are still driving their tanks around, you are having a party. It's, it's mine party. It's mine party. It's mine. 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 Somebody say it's mine. The Lord gave it to me. Then it's mine. Period. If he gave it to me, it's mine. Now, whatever happens to, has to happen to experience that can happen. My job is to believe. It's mine. There's something in between he gives and you're living in it. It's possessing it by faith. Go to Luke. Do you, do you have just a few extra minutes tonight? Or how big a rush are you in? Luke 15. I'm not quite done. Luke 15. Luke 15 is the story of what we call the prodigal son. But actually, it's the story about two sons. Isn't it? Elder son, younger son. And Luke 15, the younger boy came to his dad and he asked for his inheritance now before daddy dies. <laughs> he was not rebuked. He was not shamed. He was not corrected. He said, I want mine now. Now, if you read this whole passage, you'll see that the elder son, the younger son, is a type of us. Elder Christians and younger Christians. And that the father is a type of our father God. And the father wants us to understand it's not wrong to want your inheritance. It's not wrong to ask for it. It's not wrong to get it. Now. Somebody say now. now. The thing he did wrong is when he got it, he left father's house and went into the world and blew it and partied it away and spent it in sin. That's what was wrong. But anyway, the Bible said in verse uh, 12, the younger said, this is Luke 15, 12, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them. Everybody say them. Them. Them, them means who? Both. Not him. Them. Does them mean both boys? Yes. When did that happen? Then. Well, we know it happened right then because not many days after that, the younger boy drew it all out. Yep. Didn't he? Yep. What'd he do? 
Come on, you need to read the scripture. What, verse 13, what did he do? Yeah. Gathered. <laughs> yeah. He gathered him some. Yeah. He gathered it all. He took his now. But then he took off and left father's house. That's a big mistake. And he wasted his substance with riotous, sinful, wrong living. That's wrong. That's bad. You know the story. Spent everything. When the money was gone, so-called friends were gone. He's starving. Working for a man, peeding his figs. Uh, what did I say? I guess you needed to laugh. Huh? Uh, feeding his pigs. And so hungry, he's ready to get down in the trough with the pig. He said, what am I doing? Bible said he came to himself. And he said, how kind of people work for my dad and they eat good and here I am starving out here by the pig trough. I'm going home. I'm going to repent. I'm going to tell him I have sinned. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Would you please just... Hire me on. Give me some kind of job, please, so I can eat. But you know the story. While he was yet a far uh, a distance off, the father saw him, recognized that was his boy, and ran and met him and hugged him, pig stink and all. Yep. Didn't he? And he's, he's going to make his little speech about I'm not long, no longer, longer, longer worthy to be your son. And he says, no, no, come on here. Come on in the house. Get the good robe. Yeah. Kill the fatted calf. Get that good band to come over here. Get, get the food on. And he made a big party. Yes. I guess partying's okay. Yes. Now, isn't it something? He left Father's house to go party. Partying without God. Bad idea. Isn't it? And he found out he didn't have to leave home to party. Best party was right there in Father's house. And, and when the elder boy came in from working in the fields, he heard the music and dancing, loud music. And he heard the dancing. That's some clogging now. <laughs> he heard it. And apparently, this is all right. This is good. A lot of Christians need a revelation that it's okay to have fun. It's okay to have a lot of fun. It's okay to get loud. Party and have fun. You don't have to sin to party. People think you do, but you don't. You don't have to do wrong things. You don't have to act stupid to have fun. In fact, the best fun is clean fun. You believe it? You think we're going to have some fun in heaven? Whew. Mm. Anyway, you know the, the elder son was angry. And he wouldn't come in, verse 28. So his father went out to him. Oh, the mercy of the father. Amen. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve you, and, and neither transgressed I at any time your commandment, and yet you never gave me a kid. A kid was a little goat. You never gave me a little goat. That I could have a party with my friends, He's mad and he's hurt. I've been faithful to you. Every day I do what you tell me to do. I've stayed here. I took care of business. I, I picked up baby boy slack. He's out blowing all your hard earned money on harlots and getting drunk and doing drugs. And I'm here working and I'm keeping this place together. He shows back up, waltzes back in. You give him, you put your good clothes, your $3,000 suit on him, and your, your, your Rolex watch, and your, your, your crocodile shoes, and you, and you feed him the filet mignon, and, and you pay and have the best man in, in, in the state brought in. And you never gave me anything. It is so sad. Many Christians feel that way. I've been faithful. I've worked for you, Lord. I don't have a new car. I don't have a new house. My clothes wore out. I'm behind on this. I'm behind on that. Why won't you give me anything? 
in some year, some young yahoo comes in and gets saved next week testifying about how God gave them a new car. That's, that ain't right, God. <laughs> I've been going to church faithful for now on 43 years. And just a barely getting by. And See, there's, even, even though folks don't say it, there's a lot of people have this in them. It's under the surface. They don't say it. They try to cover it with phony smiles, but there's bitterness, anger, hurt, resentment. So the father said, oh, baby, I'm sorry. I, I should have done more for you. I, I didn't appreciate. No, that's what society will tell you. That's what religion will tell you. No. Because the father did not fail him. The father did not short him. What did he tell him? Anybody know? What did he tell him? He said, son, you're always with me. Do you, don't you think the father knows who's with him and who's not with him and who's doing for him and who's not? Do you think the father ever forgets that and can't keep up with it? No. Scripture says specifically, he is not unrighteous to forget. What we do, he never forgets. And all that I have is going to be yours when I die. No, no. I was planning on getting things to you. No, no. We already read, he divided unto them the inheritance. They both got it at the same time. Baby boy got his, blew it, used it wrong, but older boy didn't get any of it. And is mad and bitter because he's not enjoying life and doesn't have anything. What's the father saying? What are you talking about? I never gave you anything. Do you see that this elder Hard-working, faithful in the church, Christian, has no revelation that he is to possess mm -hmm. right. what has been given him. Yeah. He's waiting on the Father to spoon-feed it to him, mm -hmm. to sit him down and put it on him. What's he saying? Son, everything I've got is yours. You wanted a robe? You know where the closet is, boy. You wanted a kid? You wanted a party? You could have had a party every week. Why? The baby boy believed it. He took it. Didn't he? And he took off. But elder boy despised everything that baby boy had done and missed the great truth that he could have appropriated too. And he wouldn't have had to go on and send it away. He could have done something good with it. But you have to rise up in faith and possess. Has God given us anything? I said, has he given us anything? He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. He said, I have come that you may have life and you may have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. We haven't been enjoying, not because he didn't give it, but because we haven't possessed You got another couple of minutes? Come on. Go to Joshua then. I'll, I'll end with this, I think. Joshua 18, I believe it is. Said out loud, I am a reaper. I, am a reaper. I, have, faith I have faith to gather. I'm a possessor. I'm a, possessor. I'm a, receiver. I'm a receiver. Thank you, Lord. So be it. Joshua 18, 2. There remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. Now this is Joshua. How many understand Joshua is after Exodus? Hmm? Numbers. Deuteronomy. 
And we already read back there where God said, I give you this land. Now go possess it. Now all these years later, seven tribes still hadn't received any of it. Many years later. And here's the word of the Lord, verse 3. Joshua said to the children of Israel, How long are you slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? See, I don't know what they thought they were waiting on, but he's saying, God's already given it to us. What are you waiting on? Idleness. Slackness. How long are you going to be slack to go in and get this? Well, if you read the rest of the, the, the chapter, you'll see that they, uh, they begin to move forward and, and make effort to possess it, and, and, and many of them did. But one tribe in particular received this message completely. <laughs> it was that praising bunch, the Judah tribe. Huh? The loud bunch. <laughs> Always hollering hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Bunch that believed in healing. And yeah. Prosperity. Yeah. <laughs> Gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> when they heard him say this, what are you waiting on to possess your inheritance? The leaders looked at each other and they thought, we got to do something about this. <laughs> so, you want to possess? I, I, let's possess. We ain't waiting on God. The word of the Lord has come. He asked us to our face, what are you waiting on? Let's get her going. And they sent word to everybody, we're possessing. And they scoped it out and they mapped it out and they planned and they made provision and everybody strapped their gear on and everybody loaded up their donkeys and everybody loaded their swords and their bows and everything else. And they went and possessed. Amen. And they possessed. Amen. And they possessed. Amen. And they possessed. And they sent back word and said, we got it. We got all us up here in the north. They said, is any over to the west? Yeah. Get it. So they possessed, and they possessed, and they took some more, and they took some more, and they sent back word and said, we got her. Any down south? Well, yeah. Take it. <laughs> and they possessed, and they possessed, and they possessed, and they possessed. They sent back word and said, well, we got all of that too. And they said, well, is any over to the east? Yeah. Get it. <laughs> and they possessed, and they possessed. And they possessed. Yes. And then they possessed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I said, well, I didn't read that exactly like it that in there. <laughs> Let me tell you how I know that happened. Chapter 19. Chapter 19 and 9. Out of the portion of the children of Judah was the inheritance of the children of Simeon. They got all of their inheritance, a whole tribe, out of what Judah took. You know why? For the part of the children of Judah was too much for them Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance within the inheritance of them. And not one word about the Lord reprimanding them for taking too much. <laughs> Simeon is still dragging around and whining and hasn't got a place to live. And Judah has taken so much till they say, hey... Um, Moving over there yeah. <laughs> on the east side. We won't even know you're there. That's right. That's right. Why? Well, we done took too much. <laughs> we just got to possessing and we got to gathering and we just didn't stop. And we took too much. We took too much. Oh, theologians and crusty Christians will snarl and they go, oh, that's just too far. That's just too much. That's, you're right. That's too much. And too much is exactly what 
we need to take. Friend, there's always going to be the tribe of Simeon. They don't believe in prosperity. They don't believe in sowing and reaping like us. They don't believe it, but they're hurting and they need help. And there's got to be folks like us. People like us that just go on and take way more than they'll ever need or use so God could use them to help Simeon. What do you need with all that? There it is. Simeon needs help. <laughs> Did I read it right out of the Bible? Too much. They took too much. And it was the plan of God. Worked out perfectly. Helped the people of God. Helped a whole tribe of God's people because they took too much. I believe God's working this in us. Yes. I believe his word is building us up. Our faith, our vision, knowing how to be led, knowing what to do. I believe the Lord would flow big resources yes, sir. through us, yes. through you and me, through this church, through this ministry. Come on. We've already seen millions. You believe God's bigger than that? I said, do you believe God's bigger? Well, what's bigger than millions? Tens of millions? Hundreds of millions? Billions? Billions? Well, that's just too much. Right. Exactly right. What do you need with all that? There's got to be a tribe of Judah. There's got to be a people with passion and vision and faith that won't stop. Amen. They won't stop with a little narrow vision. They won't stop with just a few bucks. Come on. They won't stop with just one or two. They think, well, if two is good, why don't we go ahead and get ten? Huh? Why buy the car? Just buy the whole train. Why get the acre? Get the county. Why not? Yeah. Yes, and so what do you need it for? They did not know Simeon would have all their needs met when they were doing this. Right. That only happened later. And that's why I talk to you about your houses and your buildings and your lands. People say, well, what will I need with all that? There's no need for the Lord to talk to you about it and you don't have it. Right. But I assure you, when you get it, you'll find out. Yes. You'll find out Simeon needs help. Yes, praise God. And he'll be so glad. And Simeon will sit on his porch and pray for you. Because <laughs> his life is totally different. Because you took too much. Stand on your feet and lift up your hands. Let's praise the Lord.